Hello everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's episode I'm going to be reading chapter 4 from my granddad's book, Around the Horn, by Frank Downs. Chapter 4 contains RAF Central Band and Symphony Orchestra, Uxbridge Audition, Enlistment, Dennis Brain, Dennis Matthews, George Chisholm, Wing Commander O'Donnell. January 1941 brought a mixture of fortune and apprehension. Fortune in as much as early that month I met my future wife, Iris. She was 16 at this time, and though it does not sound very romantic, I have the game of table tennis to thank for our meeting. Captaining a team from my school old boys club, I visited her Methodist Chapel Social Club for a match. She was serving refreshments in the interval and thus began a life of happiness together. Like millions of others, however, I had received my call-up papers to report to the army barracks in Catterick. I was apprehensive about the future, career prospects and a lack of enthusiasm for army life. But again, my brother Herbert, incredibly, was my guiding light. I have already written that he had left Birmingham for Glasgow to join the BBC Scottish Orchestra, where that wonderful wind band, the BBC Military Band, under its conductor P.S.G. O'Donnell, was now stationed. It was for me indeed most fortunate that they were. Having lunch in the BBC canteen one day, Herbert was introduced to P.S.G., who was known to all those musicians by those initials. And in the course of that meeting, Herbert mentioned that he had a younger brother, a horn player due to be called up, who was seeking to join a forces band. Kind and helpful man that he was, PSG suggested that I should write to his younger brother Rudolf, now wing commander and director of music to the Royal Air Force Central Band in Uxbridge. I spent the next few days anxiously awaiting a reply from Uxbridge, in view of the fact that the call-up date to report to the army was only a few days ahead. The reply came, to attend an audition at Central Band Headquarters in Uxbridge, two days before I was due at Catterick. It was a cold, damp, miserable day when, after lunch, I left home, small attaché case in one hand and French horn in the other, for London. The train to Paddington was delayed owing to a derailment and it was almost dusk before my journey began. I finally arrived in London in the middle of an air raid. The noise was terrifying as I made my way to the tube. I had no idea which line Uxbridge was on. Everyone seemed to be in a hurry to get home or to a shelter. I wandered around for a time and finally found a London Underground map at the entrance of the tube station and it was well after eight o'clock when I reached Uxbridge, tired, hungry and already homesick. Not far from the station entrance I found a busy Salvation Army canteen full of servicemen and women and my goodness didn't I appreciate the warm and friendly welcome I received from a marvellous lady behind the counter serving tea and sandwiches. From that night onwards, and throughout the five years or more in the services, I had reason to thank those wonderful people who ran Salvation Army canteens, both at home and abroad. Having been given instructions as to the direction of the RAF camp, I made my way and presented my audition pass at the guard room, was told it was too late to go to Central Band headquarters a mile away, and after general scrutiny by a less than friendly corporal, who constantly referred to my horn as a bloody trumpet, found myself on the lower floor of a barrack block with about 40 other recruits and told to report to Central Band at 9.30 the next morning. The walk to headquarters seemed endless the next morning. It was at the extreme opposite end of the camp, whether by accident or design it is difficult to say. Finally reaching the main building, I opened the door to be greeted by an orchestral sound, which I immediately thought must be a recording of a famous orchestra. I was wrong. 
I walked along the corridor and peered through a small glass panel. Lo and behold, it was a real live orchestra, playing the Glinker Overture, Ruslan and Ludmilla. And about 45 musicians in RAF uniform were being conducted by a sergeant. The precision of the string playing astounded me. I was puzzled. I expected to hear a military band, and I simply had no idea that an orchestra of this standard had been recruited. A voice behind me saying, Can I help you, sir? brought me back to earth. I remember that to this day, because that was the last time I was to be addressed as sir, until my demobilisation in 1946. The questioner, a corporal, took me to a side room, told me to wait there, and within ten minutes, an officer entered the room. After several questions about my musical background, the audition began. Oral tests. Sight reading Oberon Overture of Weber and slow movement of Tchaikovsky Symphony No. 5. And finally, scales and transposition. I was not unduly nervous, but I remember being distinctly anxious about the fact that I had to be, if I was successful, enrolled pretty quickly, as I was due in Catterick the next day. To my joy, I was accepted, and after explaining my fears to the officer, things moved at an alarming speed. We'll have to get you attested immediately, he said as I was putting the French horn in its case. Now, the only time I had heard that word attested before was when it was used in the context of herds of cows. TT attested. I assumed that this meant that I was to have an injection in due course, a prospect I looked forward to with fear and dread. Within half an hour, however, I was to learn that in this sense I was to be sworn in. Together with several other recruits, most of them aircrew, I was swearing an oath of allegiance to king and country and classed as a VR, volunteer reserve member of His Majesty's Royal Air Force and from that moment on I was to be 1334560 A stroke C Downs F. Some hours later I arrived back at Band HQ dragging a kit bag full of standard equipment and a uniform which I was yet to try on for size. The incredible thing was that after I had struggled into it, it was quite a reasonable fit. No measurements had been taken of any of us in the queue at the clothing stores earlier in the day. There must have been 20 of us and all that happened as we arrived at the counter was that the sergeant looked us up and down for size, called out a size to a corporal standing next to him, and our uniforms were flung on the counter forthwith. Hardly a word passed between us, and off we went, hoping for the best. I was lucky, except for the fact that my forage cap was too small, and it kept falling off. This worried me. Playing a horn on the march with one's hat continually falling off would not have been funny, even though George Chisholm, that wonderful trombonist, could do funnier tricks, many of which I witnessed at Central Band at a later stage. I don't remember much about the sleeping quarters there, but I do remember waking up in the morning next to an airman who was covered in spots. His name, Gareth Morris, already, at an early age, one of the country's leading flautists, he had German measles. In the course of the next few days, seeing and hearing the standards around me, I must confess to being a little overawed. Never to be forgotten was the horn playing I heard coming from one of the rooms one morning. I looked through a glass panel in the door and saw a young lad about my own age, stocky in build, with a round, chubby face, producing the most glorious sound I had ever heard, and the technique was incredible. It was Dennis Brain, playing in unison with a violinist, whose name again I had heard many times on the radio, Frederick Grinker. They were playing the Shardas by Monty, Dennis obviously enjoying it as a challenge. Continuing to find my way around the next day, I was returning from breakfast at the other end of the camp and approaching the small square outside the band headquarters when I saw an airman standing to attention in the middle of the square. He looked pathetic as he was being harangued by a warrant officer. I took shelter in the shade of the porch entrance to HQ and heard the following. Stand to attention! 
The poor chap was already doing that. Matthews, you are a disgrace to His Majesty's Royal Air Force. Look at your buttons. They are going green. No creases in your trousers. And look at your boots. You haven't polished them since you joined by the look of them. Get some brill cream on your hair and comb it back. And I want to see you walking down Uxbridge High Street as though you are somebody. Swing your arms as you go and then people will say, There goes a smart airman and he plays the piano well too. He did play the piano well too. This was the Dennis Matthews I had heard play the Beethoven C minor concerto in 1938 from Birmingham. He had been at Uxbridge since May 1940. Ostensibly he was attached to Central Band and RAF Orchestra as a solo pianist. One only had to be in his company for a short time to realise that here was a musician of standing. Not only a brilliant pianist, but an intellectual of the highest order who had that rare gift of being able to communicate his musical thought so clearly. Before he was out of his teens, I saw and heard him sit at a clapped-out RAF piano to demonstrate a point of musical conversation, and in minutes he would have an audience of interested laymen around the piano seemingly fascinated by what he had to say. Born in Coventry, he was, I remember, still very upset about the terrible air raid on that city a few weeks earlier in November. On the 14th of that month, a Thursday night, which I recall vividly, terrible damage was inflicted as the world well knows. In response, Dennis offered his help in the form of a piano recital on the following Saturday, the 16th, after which he saw some of the devastation and he received a letter a few days afterwards, a copy of which I have. It was from the Mayor's Parlour, dated November the 17th, 1940, and read as follows. Dear Dennis, I wish to offer you my most sincere thanks for giving the pianoforte recital yesterday in aid of my war relief fund. I do very much appreciate your practical demonstration of sympathy towards this cause. I hear the concert was a great success and very much enjoyed by all present. I must apologise for the absence of the Mayor and myself. We were extremely sorry to miss your recital, but the terrible happenings of Thursday night caused us so much extra work, visiting the homeless, fitting up people with clothes who had lost everything, providing railway vouchers, besides interviewing various officials, that we really could not spare the time. I am sure you will understand our position at a time like this. It was all so unexpected. The raid on the town will make our fund a necessity. We shall need all we can raise to relieve the distress caused by this awful affair, so we are indeed grateful to all who, by their generous help, make such a fund possible. May I offer you our combined good wishes for your career. We can only hope that this dreadful war will soon be over, so that you can go on uninterrupted to the brilliant future prophesied for you by those in the musical world, again thanking you. Yours very sincerely, Elizabeth L. Moore, Mayoress. It is interesting to note that in the printed programme of that concert in which he played works by Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin and Brahms, some recent press cuttings were quoted. A sensitive pianist who left no doubt as to his reserve of brilliance. The Times. One knew from the opening bars that a musician was in charge. The Observer. A pianist who has the rare gift of vitalising every phrase he touches. Birmingham Post, Eric Blom. Dennis's father, Arthur Matthews, was a member of the Royal Flying Corps during the First World War and apparently had a reputation for being a daredevil. His career came to an abrupt end, however, when he was shot down over France and as a result of his injuries, he suffered an amputated leg. Once demobbed, he set up an engineering firm in Leamington with a partner named Norman and between them they produced a revolutionary light engine which the firm manufactured with some success. Fitted to an Omega machine and ridden by a rider called Dallison, the Norman engine was responsible for two world records at Brooklands on the 24th of April 1924 achieving astounding speeds of 50.37 and 51.31 miles per hour, respectively. For a time, the engineering works prospered. Then things began to go fatally wrong. 
Arthur had been subject to spells of depression since the loss of his leg, and coupled with other problems, his depression finally overwhelmed him and he took his own life. Dennis, who was at Arnold Lodge School in Leamington, was told of his father's death by the headmaster and was also told he would now have to be a boarder. His mother offered no explanation, not even in later life. He was profoundly upset, having dearly loved his father, and with no sisters or brothers to turn to, he was very unhappy. He won a scholarship to Worcester Royal Grammar School as a boarder, but disliked it and ran away, back to Leamington, and eventually he settled down happily at Warwick School as a day boy, flourishing both as a scholar and as a musician. The tragedy of Christmas Eve 1988, when Dennis took his own life, occurred just when it seemed he was settling down happily after his marriage to Beryl Chempin. She was kind and understanding, and an ideal person, we thought, to help him recover from his earlier depression. It seemed very sad that she should have to bear this blow after such a comparatively short time. The shock seemed to bring into sharp focus the young and seemingly happy RAF musician at Uxbridge, who had a great career ahead of him. His sense of humour was infectious, his repertoire of stories and limericks was legendary, and his enthusiasm for life inspiring. Prior to his RAF service, Dennis had, at a local music festival, come to the notice of the adjudicator, Harold Craxton, who had suggested that he should apply for a scholarship to the Royal Academy. He applied and was successful, and in 1936 went to stay for a few nights with the Craxton family whilst he settled down at the Academy. He stayed for four years. Dennis used to say that he was accepted as part of the family and that he had some of the happiest days of his life there amongst six children. It was at Robert Donat's house near Wendover that he met his charming first wife, Mira. Mira, a cellist, relates how she and her violinist friend, Jean Layton, were invited to join a young pianist from the Academy to play trios at Robert's house. Apparently, Robert's wife and children had left for the States to avoid bombing raids, and he had, in his loneliness, wanted to enjoy the company of young people and listen to chamber music. It was shortly after this that Dennis was invited by Myra Hess at short notice to give a recital at the National Gallery and his playing at this concert was of such excellence that his career was more or less assured. Dennis and Mira married in November 1941 and were blissfully happy. Earlier in that same year, however, Musicians were expected to become combatants as threat of invasion had become very real. Dennis was posted temporarily to the RAF station at Sheppey and taught how to use a Lewis gun when not playing selections from Snow White with an ad hoc group of RAF musicians in the camp canteen. But I am afraid I did not even reach that military attainment due to the fact that a few weeks previously on the shooting range at Uxbridge, lying down on sandbags, I had been so nervous that I had pulled the trigger prematurely and almost shocked the instructing corporal. He ordered me off the range with a mouthful of invective, most of it not to be found in the English dictionary. In truth, I did not see that shooting range again during the whole of my time at Uxbridge. All musicians stationed at Central Band were allowed to live at home and were able to accept limited numbers of professional engagements as long as they appeared on parade first thing in the morning with buttons shining and boots polished, not forgetting hair to be cut short. In those early morning parades it seemed to me, as the band sergeant called the names, that he was reading from the current musicians who's who. Martin D. Blech H. Brain D. Brain L. Grinker F. Grilla S. O'Brien J, Burton P, Hampton C, Cummings K, Del Mar N, to name a few of the galaxy of musical talent gathered together to form the RAF orchestra. One thing which did strike me about nearly all of them was their friendliness, particularly David Martin, who got me out of a tight corner one morning when I was hopelessly late for the parade. 
I was living at the time at my cousin's house in Uxbridge High Street, and having overslept I was running full steam ahead about a mile from the camp. Pausing for a few moments, completely out of breath and sweating profusely, I met David, who was not in a particular hurry. He had been excused early parade that morning. Telling him of my plight, he reacted with an immediate rescue plan. Sit there, he said, and I will go in and tell them that you are unwell and in need of help. I sat there in fear and trembling, wondering whether the ruse would work. It did, and shortly afterwards I was taken by jeep to the sick bay, where I rested for the whole of the morning, eternally thankful to David. I was not so lucky a few days later, however, when two older regulars of the military band had fun with a raw recruit. Searching around for a piano on which to practice, I was unfortunate enough to ask them if they knew of one that might be free. Yes, they said, taking me along a corridor. There's a lovely grand in there, pointing to a room. I thanked them, opened the door, and sure enough there was a lovely grand piano, lid up, and just waiting to be played. You'll be all right in there for an hour or two, they said as they departed. I can't remember whether it was a Steinway or a Beckstein. All I recall is how lovely it was to find an instrument of such high quality. After practising scales and arpeggios, I was halfway through a Schubert impromptu when I became conscious of someone entering the room and standing behind me. I went on playing for quite a few more bars before stopping to look around. I immediately stood to attention, frozen in every limb. Standing there and glowering at me with obvious incredulity was the director of music himself, Wing Commander R.P. O'Donnell. Out! he thundered, pointing to the doorway. I obeyed instantly. And get your hair cut! echoed down the passage as I departed post haste. Get your hair cut! It seemed to be a phrase which every officer and NCO had to include in every form of admonishment, no matter what the subject of the charge was. On this occasion, I could not understand it. I had had my hair cut only 48 hours beforehand. Fortunately, my misdemeanour was not followed up. I heard no more about the incident. What it did do, however, was to make me very wary of falling into any other such trap. For the first few weeks, my playing experience was confined to the military band rehearsals, which always began with half an hour of scales in unison at varying tempi, followed by arrangements of the standard repertoire conducted by NCOs of varying ability. It was inevitable, I suppose, that in the circumstances, ludicrous situations would develop. One morning, sitting in the horn section, I witnessed an NCO instructing Dennis Brain on how he should phrase the slow movement of the Fifth Symphony of Tchaikovsky, and getting thoroughly unpleasant when that young virtuoso suggested, very politely and diplomatically, that his instructions were unmusical. What these characters did, if questioned by players on musical points, was to immediately bristle and pull rank, pointing to the insignia of rank on their arms. It was a difficult position for all service bands and orchestras when war brought into these organisations musicians of high repute. Stories are legion about farcical and comical situations which came about from time to time. There was the authentic story which was going around when I first joined. It concerned a well-known violinist who led one of the service's orchestras. He apparently asked the bandmaster if he could play a concerto. His request was granted and he chose the Beethoven. The first rehearsal began with the solo drum beats, at which the bandmaster stopped and inquired of the timpanist. What have you got written there? Five drum beats, sir, came the reply. Cut them out, said the bandmaster. Start on the second bar. There's really no need for you to give us the tempo. I distinctly remember our conductor at a concert in Reading Town Hall, conducting the whole of the Hebrides Overture in three. And another bandmaster, where it was I do not recall, but he began the rehearsal of the Rossini Boutique Fantasque by saying to an incredulous band, 
To those of you who do not know what the title means, and I don't suppose many of you do, it means in English, the fantastic boot shop. Dennis Matthews used to swear that one notable came to him one morning, quite excited, saying, Matthews, I have found a new overture for military band by Beethoven. Oh, have you, sir? said Dennis. Yes, came the reply. Prometheus, do you think you could orchestrate it? I'll have a try, sir, he replied, after the tour. The tour of Oxfordshire and surrounding air bases being due the following week. Needless to say, the story was received with great hilarity amongst colleagues and after the tour no more was heard of the great discovery. I had, since coming to Uxbridge, been able to fulfil my earlier ambition to continue studies at the Royal College and was given a scholarship to study horn with Frank Probyn, known universally by horn players as The Major. A member of that memorable horn quartet in Beecham's London Philharmonic Orchestra, Gregory, Burroughs, Bradley and Probyn, he was also a fine teacher who took a great interest in his pupils and produced some outstanding players over many years. On first acquaintance, it was not difficult to understand how he acquired the title The Major, for he certainly had the bearing of a military gentleman, though it became obvious in a very short time that his musical approach to teaching was far from militaristic. I always found that his lessons were interesting and frequently inspiring. My only regret was that owing to RAF duties, I was unable to take a more active part in college life. End of chapter four. Andrew Downs followed in his father's footsteps in many ways. He himself learnt to play the French horn and he also studied singing and composition at the Royal College of Music with Herbert Howells. I am therefore going to end this episode with the first movement of Andrew Downs' Sonata for Four Horns performed by the hornists of the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra for a CD which is actually in memory of Frank Downs called Andrew Downs' Music for Horns and Wagner Tubers for the Artisman label. Thank you.